Graham Hunter, good morning to you. How are you? Yeah, grand, yeah. Um, was it raining? Was it raining where you were last night as well? Because that weather looked pretty bad. The rain in Spain it's, falls mainly everywhere. It's uh, now it's a little bit of a strange one, Jim, in that uh, the last three Madrid matches have been an, under an absolute deluge, and it's affected them. I mean, you know, tough luck. Uh, but both the Clásico, which they should have won by a bucket full of goals and didn't, then the Betis game that they drew nil nil, uh, causing Rafa Nadal playing in the bus on an open of tennis to exclaim when he heard the scoreline. That's the, that's the league gone. Uh, and now this one, which, um, you know, I don't expect many uh, little violins to be played in sympathy for them because that's the weather, ain't it? But when you're a slow, tired, aging team, as Romadid are, and you're playing against, um, I think at the last count, it was 16 Chelsea players on the pitch at the same time. And it's absolutely bucketing down. And um, you're sodden, you're slowing down still. The pitch is starting to give way under your feet. It didn't help them whatsoever. So if Florentino thinks he can fix um, how European football goes, he, he may want to start with the weather, you're right. Or stick a roof on the on the training ground, maybe. That's the... It's an idea. You know? It's an idea. It's yeah, it's a shame. it's a shame for them, isn't it, that the... I mean, the, the new state. This is what you want to talk about. The new stadium will not only have a roof, like a sort of um, Bella Lugosi thing. The, the pitch is going to sleep under the Paseo Castellano, the, this massive long uh, road that kind of splits Madrid and runs alongside the site of the Santiago Bernabeu. It's going to become uh, an event stadium, whereby for the I don't know how many times, uh, 19 league matches and 10 European and Six cup. Let's say at the maximum uh, 40 times a year, they'll, they'll take the pitch, they'll elevate the pitch from buried way under the road and elevate it and, and put it in place in the stadium. And the stadium will be covered when they want it to be and air conditioned and so on and so forth. It's going to be an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary place, which will make them so much more money than they have right now. Um, assuming, you know, given that um, Bontino was out on the big issue the other day, assuming they make it that far, then yes, it's a little bit sad for them that they didn't have a roof over the, over the stadium in Valdez last night. Um, Thomas Ducal is, is clearly a student of football. He's obviously a very good manager and, and clearly watched what Liverpool didn't do in the previous game. We're like, mm, I, might, I might not try that. I might actually <laughs> go after your old guys. And the, the expression perfect storm is when several things coincide and you go, wow, how did that happen? Because he did. And Tuchel's done that in each of the four times previously. I've been at or reporting on all of the four previous ties when um, a, a pair of two twos with Dortmund and Roma did in the group stage and then a thrashing in Paris from Tuchel's Paris and Germain and then a 2-2 at um, the Bernabeu where Madrid controlled the game were two up, should have run away with it. And, and Tuchel's men kept pressing and harassing and chasing and snarling. And they, they, they finally got a 2 2 again. I thought last night was identical in concept, Jared. Duke, Tuchel must have taken messages from the Liverpool game. And we knew coming in that Chelsea were different from Liverpool, that they are, I, I don't know, average age younger, but they're certainly, they've been less um, spent over recent seasons, marching all over Europe dominating the Premier League, running till the lungs and legs don't work anymore. And therefore, it was always the prospect that, for example, Cross and Modric, each of whom have been injured recently, each of them were, you know, well over 30, Benson, Matu, Carvajal, Nacho. All of those guys were going to be really chased to an inch, a millimetre of their life. But the perfect storm thing comes when Casemiro, a little bit younger than his, his cohorts, and normally the guy who'll who sort of um, sack the players and the other uh, team when they try to launch passes, just stands off Rudiger for the first goal, stands off him and, and says to him, you know, try a showboat quarterback pass. And it was the mirror image, the exact opposite of what was happening when whoever it was, I think it was Manny and Salah and um, Jota, didn't close down Tony Cruz in, in the game that you were referring to and he launched for a and Vinicius. Well, Rudiger did the same for Pulisic, and and until the 1-1, and, and more particularly until after half-time, 
you know, Ger, <clears throat> I, 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 I'm envisaging if you pair together this game and the Betis game, which not all of your viewers and listeners will have seen at the weekend. But if you can imagine being in any company and the boss, the executives tell you, this is your goal. This is everything. This is where your salary comes from. This is where your bonuses are. This project that you're on, this building project, this campaign that you're designing, whatever it is, this is everything. And then about eight months into that that project, the big boss goes into the media, doesn't tell you, and say, well, this, that project, you know, it, it stinks of rotten eggs. This is their new goal. And the people in the office are like, oh, well, oh, well, thanks for that. And that's how I remember they've been playing since Florentino came out and said, um, you know, La Liga, the Champions League, you know, bleh, bleh. you know, I, I want this and, oh, oh, lads, this thing you've been, you know, busting your bollocks off over for the last eight months and the things that, that that's made you supersede tiredness and any worries about COVID, that, that, that doesn't really matter. And I'm sorry I didn't tell you directly. And Real Madrid have been playing like a, a bunch of men who are, are supreme professionals, are, are born winners, and, and who still value the work that they've been putting in themselves. But but they're, they're like, oh, well, the, the guy who runs the club isn't all that keen on La Liga or the Champions League. And they've, they've, they've lost a yard in both of the last two games since the Ferrari when Florentino not only made an absolute, you know, idiot of himself the first time, but then continued on his own to declare that, you know, this Super League thing is a project. And, you know, across when I listen into your programmes, Jeff, you cover all sports with brilliance. And the number of times I've heard people across, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, on the back of a horse or it's basketball or it's golf or it's somebody at the elite level of NFL or soccer or rugby, GAA, psychology comes up again and again and again. That that brilliant place you can go to when you're in the zone, when the psychology is perfect. If you don't have that, that edge where great champions or rugby champions say, well, this is where I lost it. Well, you know, what the hell was Florentino Perez thinking to, to, to come away with this nonsense at a time when his team stood a chance of of knocking Chelsea out? They haven't lost that chance completely, but he hasn't helped here. And, and the evidence was on the pits last night. Yeah, like that—that that is a really interesting conversation around the fact that they haven't lost this chance at all. And in fact, it seemed to the naked eye that they'd almost arrested something that was getting away from them a little bit in that first half. It came down to Chelsea, or to Real Madrid, having a number nine who is exceptionally good at his job and has been throughout his entire Champions League career compared to Chelsea, who's got a number nine who really can find a goal at the moment. That's the sort of thing that could be absolutely vital in a second leg. I, I couldn't agree more. If, if you're talking about Werner, um, I had a conversation with one of my, one of my best people at, at high level at Liverpool when the, when, when the race was on last summer. And I put forward to him, I, I, I said, listen, I think he's not a natural finisher. He's he's a flat track bully. The number of goals scored in the Bundesliga was notable last season. But if you look at him in any any high level game, when I was following for club or country, the thing you noticed was that if, if Werner gets beyond a back line on his own, or if he served up something against a, a minor team with minor pressure, there's a guy who isn't only the product of his pace but nonetheless he's somebody who because throughout his life because his pace hasn't learned the intricacies of finishing he's he's kind of been used to shooting fish in a barrel because he gets into positions time and time again whereby he's more likely to score and for for in situations whereby it's not all or nothing as you're describing last night was and i i feel vindicated that across this season i don't want to see the poor guy suffer but across this season, what's led to his his um, his kind of dread of being put in a pressure situation is that he's missed again and again and again. And I, I think last night was was one of the worst because the the setup header from Pulisic was was glorious. And yeah, you've got Courtois, big old octopus hands, ready to try and smother you. But but the goal was gaping and on a scale. You know, that was a, a 9.9 .9 out of 10. It's a goal. And Benzema was, was a 1.1 1 .1 out of 10 that is, is, should have been a goal. And I agree with you. It was glorious. Absolutely phenomenal finish. But, you know, to compound the thing, Chelsea went to sleep. That I, I really meant that, that little joke that at times, and, and I think this is a symbol of any great performance, at times it, I wasn't just counting. Are there really only 11 blue shirts on here? 
uh, some of the Real Madrid players looked like they were counting instead of paying attention to their duties. And then at that corner, when when you you feel that if Chelsea just just inch up towards another gear, they, they put Real Madrid out, and Chelsea are going to the final in this one. At that corner, it's the simplest of things. All the prep that Jerry was talking about that you know, Tuchel and his team were looking at the Liverpool Real Madrid game. You look at any Real Madrid game. And it's about a sort of 60-40 margin about whether Cruz will put the ball into the penalty area or he'll knock it short to Modric. And they allowed Cruz and Modric out there on their own and Marcelo. And, and Kante in the end is scampering out, but it's too late. And uh, what they've given is, because everybody in the box knows what, what this move is, is going to bring, it's, it's rehearsed. And, and Marcelo's passing, crossing angle is fantastic. Uh, after that, it, it, it needs uh, Casemiro to outjump whoever, I think, outjump uh, Rudiger. And then it needs... Uh, Militao to outjump Christensen, but at the point the ball arrives at Benzema, you, you know, it's only the greats, only the greats, and the numbers, the idea that, you know, I I, I don't like the idea of people bringing it off the side of it, Lewandowski, and it, Lewandowski is a finisher, but he's not half the player Benzema was, and the fact that Benzema's drawn even with Raul at the top of the scoring charts, and with Lewandowski out, if, if Benzema manages to carry on in this tournament for two more matches, he should probably overtake Lewandowski and, and get up there as what I, I don't know third top scorer in and around third top scorer of the all-time Champions League. That doesn't that doesn't do him justice. He, he just he invents movements, he invents assists, he, he sees space in a way that most people get befuddled by. It's been n- not right from the outset, but increasingly across his well over ten, about eleven years in in Spain, it's just been outright Rolls Royce pleasure uh, watching him throughout. He's he's exceptional. And it, it just it just makes football fun to watch. Doesn't matter who you support, he's extraordinary. I, I don't think he ever went through a period like Timo Werner is going through now, but Benzema has had his tough moments. And maybe it was just one season, Graham, if, like I'm just kind of speaking from, from memory here. But what did he do? What did he change after that one season or whatever it was to become like I mean, in, in this amazing company, the, the deserved top four uh, in in uh, the top four scores in Champions League history. Oh, oh and there's a, there's such a list. Um, f- for example, he's without being judgmental, he's always been involved in things away from the pitch that have caused huge controversy. And and gradually, one of the things he's done is to learn to completely detach one from the other, and he's done that extraordinarily. Secondly. There was a moment when Benzema said, "You're not, uh, pardon me, Zidane, not his coach at this stage." I think at that stage, uh, Zidane would have been either a club ambassador or nominally the the football director of the club. And he took Benzema aside and said, "You're not lean enough." And he said to him, "Look, this is how I live. There's a there's a nice sort of health spa up in the Dolomites where summertime go there. They change your eating habits and." He lost four or five kilos. He's never put those kilos back on again. He stayed completely um, live and lean and athletic, well into what will be. I think he'll turn 34 in December, if my memory's good. And he's still playing like he were 27, 28. That was a big change because he was never in any way rotund. But he did carry more uh, weight than than he does now and, and Zidane helped him, helped him sort that and one of the great uh, things that changed him into the beast that you're admiring now and is that people people often say and I've often used this phrase and I mean it that in cycling terms he, he became sort of lead domestic to the team leader which is Ronaldo and everybody says well he did that role brilliantly and now what's exceptional is that that's probably since Cristiano left I think that's about 90 goals that Benzema has scored a ratio far greater than when he was supporting a best supporting actor. But the process of learning how to create space for Cristiano, the process of working out how to play as a two, and not just to say, here's the ball boss, here's the ball boss, none of that nonsense. He, he was strategically involved in working out what the other side couldn't do, where Cristiano would arrive, when occasionally, because Benzema did score when Cristiano was in the team, when occasionally it was a better option to, to go himself. That learning process t- dovetails exactly with what you're asking because he became a completely different footballer than the guy at Lyon or the guy who arrived um, at Real Madrid and was in outright competition with Higuain. And that would be my last point. 
when um, when Mourinho slagged him off in public, they were about to go and play at Osasuna, I think. And Higuain was um, was was absent, and Mourinho, you know, clown that he is, said, you know, if you if you if you've got to go hunting um, and, and you don't have your hunting dog, then you take a cat with you. Some what a man. And Benzema knew he was talking about him, and he went and saw him. You know, finger finger in the chest time about I respect you and I work for you and don't speak about me in it. And again, that was the making of the man. He stood up to Mourinho and gradually won his place against Higuain compared to previously. Eventually, Mourinho moved on. That made a big difference to Benzema. And he spent his whole life modelling himself on Ronaldo and Nassario, the Brazilian, because they're still in close contact now. Obviously, this last year by phone only. But when you have that as a role model and, and you go through all the learning experiences at the most political club in the world, then either you get spat out or it turns out that you're all-time great and, and Benson was all-time great. The one last thing is obviously as controversial as his exclusion from the France team has been, it, you know, it's helped him. Fewer injuries, less travel, more recuperation time, that helps. It's funny, the international football thing helping uh, elongate careers might have been interesting to see what would happen in the Super League if all those players were banned from playing international football. Uh, that's an aside that would um, take an hour to tease out. What about tonight's game? We're all incredibly excited if both teams can have something approximating, if their superstars can play, um, particularly Mbappe. Uh, what do you expect to happen over these two legs? Because I, I kind of don't really understand or know yet what's going to happen. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm in every aspect. It, it, it's so tantalising because... Um, we, we are definitely looking at in, in Mbappe, one of the most um, phenomenal emergences in, in this game that we love for many, many years. I've got no doubt about that. I haven't since the first time. I haven't since I was interviewing John Collins, ex-Monaco, who'd, who'd recently been asked to take over Monaco again by the Prince and hadn't, and the Russian had bought in. And, and for the big interview, John said, look, look out, look out, there's, there's, there's some really special players. One of them is Mondi, another one is Mbappe. And John at that stage, and Mbappe at that stage was 17, said, look, in Monaco, they're talking about a player who's 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 already greater than Thierry Henry was at that age and will go on to equal him. And I thought, well, okay, it's a big claim. And, and you kind of see where they were going. I think Mbappe is extraordinary. And as you look at this tie, I think that uh, Paris Saint-Germain are in slightly better form probably in slightly better physical shape. And if they can impose that and unleash uh, Neymar and Mbappe, I'm assured both of them are going to be available, then they're they're a really good team, I think. I think they're an inc- a, a better team than they've been throughout this massive star-studded rebuild um, under the ownership that has spent so many hundreds of millions. I, I think they're a, a tougher, um, better matched unit across the pitch. Uh, than they have been, and therefore, that's a test for City. And and the thing that that will attract me most um, tonight and next week is that Guardiola's regime is is looking is in need of uh, a night like this. They've done so many things which have been um, extraordinary, enlightening. They've they've changed the perception of football in England a little bit. I think that they've been admirable in in number of things they've done including the way that they play um the way the, the, the number of goals they score how they score the goals the the chest like changing of positions on the pitch as a concept not just in in the midst of red hot action all of these things have taught us they've made us think even for those who who um disavow that style of play or, or Guardiola's ideas it challenges you to think so that right across from ourselves in this industry, from the fans, um, right through everybody who's involved in the science of football. What Guardiola has been doing has been, you know, a shot of energy, a shot of development into the game. And I think it's absolutely laudable personally. But do, do I see them as outright favourites? I probably don't. And I think that they've been in need of a big night where they do where they do the old fashioned thing, where they go, There's a, it's against us here. Um, we're going to dig deep and we're going to produce either mountains of character, mountains of stubbornness, uh, moments of genius. Because I don't think often 
um, they, they've they've done that. And and then the Aguero moment for Mancini was 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 separate. It was up on a you know on a, on a little you know ivory tower of its own. But it's interesting that that's the thing that will will abide forever and ever as a moment as a game compared to maybe many of uh, Guardiola's City games. This would be the time, uh, and I think that I think they've got their work cut out tonight. A little bit, tiny little bit of form, tiny little bit lacking in energy. One or two of the key players shaking off injury, and therefore, it, I suppose the last time it was Guardiola Pochettino, by my memory at least, was at or around the stages of the Champions League, and it was you know they in the first leg they dominated away from home against the Pochettino team. Spurs missed a penalty. In the second leg, they had that crazy offside goal, they had the Renti um, handball that helped shape how FIFA rules on handball were then interpreted. It was a colossal game. And it, kind of everything went against Guardiola and his team for whatever reason. So they need to reverse that tonight. I genuinely think this needs to be one of those nights where both things fall for you and, and some of his men do exceptional uh, things. That, that has to be the case. Otherwise... Paris Saint-Germain are certainly good enough to, to, to head off to Manchester with the lead. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Graham. you've set the scene beautifully for us. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Cheers, lads. Graeme Hunter giving us the thoughts there. Yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts too. I know loads of you have got in touch and uh, we'll get to them in just a couple of minutes. 0879 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, 